Hello and welcome to Uninformed Summary, a podcast where four friends with four different levels of knowledge on the topic get together and discuss that topic. This week's topic is Mel Blank, the man of a thousand voices. I'm Mike. I'm in the hot seat today. Uh, I did the most research for this topic. Uh, second was Scott. Say hello, Scott. Hello. Scott took a, a couple hours to watch some YouTube, read the Wikipedia, just kind of get a general familiarization without actually doing a lot of research. Behind Scott was Matt. Say hello, Matt. Hi. Matt took about an hour or so to, to look over the topic, and in the dunce seat this week is Vinny. Hi, Vinny. Hi, Vinny. <laughs> this week we're going to talk about Mel Blanc. Um, he was born in San Francisco, California on May 30th, 1908. His full name is Melvin Jerome Blank. Jerome. Uh, Jerome, yeah. So, so not uh, Melvert Black. No. Me- Melvin Jerome Blank, spelled B-L-A-N-K. Okay. So not Blanc. Yeah, I'll admit that's my first misperception. This is going to be a yeah. long night. Me too. <laughs> Right, Melvin Jerome Blank, spelled B-L-A-N-K, um, which is different from the way he spelled it later in his life, um, because uh, in high school, he had a teacher that would get on him all the time because he was kind of a class clown, uh, and he'd joke around a lot, and his teacher told him that he was going to end up just like his last name, a blank oh. in life. Jeez, so, okay. Yeah, his, his teacher told him basically he would amount to nothing, and he would be a big blank, so he uh, yeah. changed his name. Was his teacher my dad? <laughs> I don't know. Was your dad alive in 1923? I don't know. I haven't seen him <laughs> ever. <laughs> uh, also around the time that he decided to change his name is when he got his first job as a radio performer uh, on KGW uh, doing a show called Stories by Aunt Nell, which was a weekday program for children. Aww. Yeah. So 15-year-old Mel Blank working on the radio, and uh, he would continue to work on the radio. A few years later, uh, he dropped out of high school, and um, the same radio station, KGW, hired him for its popular Hoot Owls program, uh, where he he wrote and performed. It was like a late-night variety show on the radio. So he would do different skits or play music or just different things like that. Um, he was very skilled in instruments. He uh, he could play the horn and the ukulele, violin. He played bass guitar, all sorts of stuff. Damn. Yeah, and uh, so he was very musically inclined. Um, and then eventually he would move back to San Francisco. So he would leave Oregon um, as an adult and go back to San Francisco where he was born. And uh, he and his older brother, Henry, um, started uh, – Henry worked for uh, – KFWI in San Francisco as the program director and they would uh, bring he would come in there um, but eventually the station closed down and the the crash in 1929 that we're all familiar with oh no what happened um, <laughs> I bet people Isn't got real that? depressed by a crash that, or some I sort. think that's the one all the dust moved in I also think there was like it was some sort of like shopping area where they had a lot of bulls and cattle and cheap and like it just fell apart i don't know something about a stock market crash (laughs) yeah i see so then he went prices only had some like it was like one of the factors but it wasn't the main factor in the great depression right but that was (laughs) i think we have an idea on what our next one of our future episodes is going to be on (laughs) actually Um, so so (laughs) then went back to oregon after the kfwi closed down in 29 and back to that Hoot Owl show, the, the variety program that he worked on. Um, and like I said, he was a consummate performer. He did his own music. He did, obviously, dialects and different characters and things. And and uh, he was so good on this radio show that uh, the RKO Orpheum Theater in Portland decided to uh, make him the musical director in 1931. So he started... Um, selecting which acts would come on in this theater uh different like vaudeville acts or uh large bands things like that mm-hmm. um and then he uh he himself led an 11 piece band that would perform on the stage but it was also the hoot owls orchestra on his radio show um so it was known as mel blank and the rko westerners 
Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, so so he he got his start mostly in music and vaudeville, which is at the time was was the popular thing on radio. Which if is like all over those Looney Tunes and shit, right? Like the stuff he was doing, it's all music. It's like big bands, and if I remember my cartoons, it's like you know, and they're on the stages and performing, and there's all these like elements of that big swing and all this cool like music performative stuff. Right. Yeah, I, and we'll find later that that <clears throat> when that comes in, that it continued his his musicality. We'll say. Scott. It's kind of interesting too, because like, uh, at so at sixteen he changes his name from blank to blank. Um, that hurts to say, um, <laughs> all because a teacher said that he'd never amount to anything, and then like three years later he becomes the youngest conductor in the country. <laughs> like, dude, talk about like turning things around. Yeah, <laughs> almost Good like point. he had a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> He had a blank on his shoulder. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, he was getting very, very popular in Portland and all up and down the West Coast because in the 1930s, radio broadcasts couldn't go across the country. So it was kind of a regional thing where uh, – so it started in Portland, and then if, once you're at a big enough station, it would broadcast enough to hit California and stuff, but it wouldn't make it all the way to, say, New York. <clears throat> But uh, in 1931, NBC hired him as the master of ceremonies for the road show. But uh, shortly after that announcement, the program was canceled. So he went from NBC in San Francisco back to, to Oregon. He does a lot of back and forth between those two places. But uh, in 32, he left uh, Portland again to go back to Los Angeles this time, where he became a regular on the Don Lee Network uh, the program was called Merry Makers. It was uh, K O I N was the radio station, um, but he didn't do very hot there. It wasn't uh, a popular program. It didn't make a whole lot of money. The you're saying that the program on Coin didn't make a whole lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. That, that escaped. That did escape me. <laughs> hey, also, uh, real quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, are there? Are there? This is me being ignorant. Are there cartoons yet at this like, um, point in time? Are we There just... are, but not in the way. So we're in like 1932, which is right, right when Walt Disney starts taking off. Okay. Uh, cool. Because if I remember right, I, I didn't do research on Walt Disney, but I think Mickey Mouse Steamboat Willie was in like 1930, 1931. I'm sure the internet can answer that question. Yeah, that's another podcast. But it seems like funny to be talking about his rise and – his, his career starting and all this stuff, and I'm just all I know uh, him 19, as. 1928 was <laughs> yeah. Steamboat Willie. So, yeah. Um, so yes, cartoons exist, but they are a lot of times right before a movie. They would be like instead of having previews, you would have a, a cartoon or an animated short. Um, and then Steamboat Willie was also the first animated short to have sound, if I remember right. So like the whole sound with moving pictures is still kind of a new concept. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's street. wild. All right, thank so, you. I had to put it into place. Well, that's, that's good, but that's why he does so much on radio because we think now your main source of entertainment is computer is on the internet. But before us, the generation before us, it was television. TV didn't come around until the fifties, so you had to get your entertainment some way, and every household had a radio. So that was that was how to get your name out there and your talent, and then hope to get picked up by a bigger radio station, which. Mel was kind of in the process of doing. He was bounced around. He saw NBC a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but then when uh, Mary Makers over on KOIN kind of flopped, uh, not a whole lot was going on for Mel. He was still doing his, his show in Portland, from what I could tell, the, the Hoot Owls program. Uh, and then on May 14th, 1933, Blank married his sweetheart, Estelle Zelda Rosenbaum. And this would be his first and only wife, which is admirable, speaking from experience. I, I, I am loving this episode so far, um, just from the perspective of a, every time that you start going into extreme detail about him, um, it sounds as though it's been redacted by the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, continue. 
Um, so then he started a new show in Portland uh, called Cobwebs and Nuts, which was another late night program. But this time it was no longer on KGW, it was on KEX. Um, but that ended in 1935, where he moved back to LA. And by 1936, he was on KNX's Hollywood Barn Dance and the Jello program starring Jack Bunny on NBC Network. Sorry, Jack Benny. <laughs> yeah, the bunny's not yet, right? That's the right. Not yet. Yeah, that's we're getting, we're getting close. We're getting warm. <laughs> uh, so Jack Benny was uh, was a huge radio personality. Eventually, he became a TV personality as well. But he was kind of, if you got on the Jack Benny show, you were doing something right. It was kind of the the Carson or the Ed Sullivan of the '30s, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but he got his on the Jello program starring Jack Benny. Um, he was doing barnyard animal impressions. That's that was his gig on that show. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we really then, need uh, something that will keep the audience uh, paying attention. What, 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 what do you got? A little moo and an oink, you know. <laughs> Well, and something and, uh, I, I read uh, that I, in my research, is that uh, like him and Jack Benny, you know, although their friendship obviously would continue, when whenever they were around each other, uh, Mel would consistently keep a straight face no matter what he was saying, no matter how outrageous. And it was <laughs> really hard for Jack Benny to get through certain bits because of the fact that he would be looking over at him just pan faced. Uh, as he's delivering these hilarious, uh, you know, situations. So. Oh, and, and, and that's something else. Like, um, I don't know what you saw or watched, but the, he did a little thing that was about a uh, uh, a gentleman from Tijuana named Sai. Yes. Okay. If, yep. if you've seen I, that skit. Yep. So it's, see, see. Okay. So <laughs> in, in the skit, he's supposed to be a mariachi or something from Tijuana. Mm -hmm. And Jack, I think it's Jack Benny's talking to him, and he goes, "Ah, oh, I see you. You brought your your bass guitar there. Uh, your name's Sai, right? C. And uh, or no, what's your name? Sai. Sai. C. And it would go back and forth. And it's like, oh, is that your sister over there? Yeah. Or C. What's her name? Sue. And, and just the whole time, he's just deadpan, blank stare, and it's it's hilarious. Oh, it's blank like, stare. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, a there. Yeah. That, that's that trademarked. Funny. I'm not certain if we can even say that on here. <laughs> so while he's working with Jack Benny, getting kind of his his career's really starting to roll now, um, he decides to go over to Warner Brothers, which is a big movie, big deal in the movies at this time. Uh, and he tried to do voice auditions for them, and, but he was repeatedly reje rejected. So tried, didn't get the job, didn't get the job, didn't get the job. But then the manager of Warner Brothers the, the person who would pick the people, he died in 1936. Uh, and his replacement gave Mel an audition <laughs> and hired him. Well, that's and, right. I guess that's a good well, thing. And the, right. thing, the thing about that guy was, is so what I watched was, I watched this whole documentary on him, uh, uh, Mel Blank. That is the first and only time I'm going to get that right. And, uh, <laughs> and what he said was, is he's like, so I went to Warner Brothers. I can't do his voice or any of them, but he's like, I went to Warner Brothers and I said, hey, uh, I think I've got some talent for you guys that would be really helpful. Um, you know, if, since you guys are getting into different things, I, I I think I could, do you know, do really well. And the guy's like, yeah, we don't really need any voice actors or, you know, anyone doing any sort of voice work. But thank you. And he's like, all right, cool. So he's like, I came back two weeks later and I asked him again. And he said no. And I asked him again two weeks after that. And he kept doing that. And he said he, he said that he went there uh, every two weeks for two years. Oh my gosh. And uh and then finally that guy died. <laughs> <laughs> and the happy ending of Mel Bling. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> right. So the audition that they were trying <laughs> Mel Blank out for was for a short called Porky's Road Race, which was his first Looney Tunes animated film. I know that uh, name. And that came out February seventh, nineteen thirty seven. Um, yeah, so or he wasn't the original voice of Porky Pig. I, I found that interesting. I don't recall the gentleman's name who it was, but there was somebody that did two or three shorts before Mel Blank took over for Porky Pig. And it was a completely different take on the voice. Like Mel said that uh, Porky looked kind of like a shy uh, kind of character. So that's why he gave him the stutter was to personify that 
because Porky's always this kind of like, uh, what's going on? You know, he's always got his feet stepping on top of each other. He's just always a really shy character. So to personify that, he gave him the stutter, which I thought was interesting. It's amazing. And that was also, um, I'm not sure if it was that one exactly, but it was very close to this time that um, it was about a contract dispute. Uh, Mel didn't think he was making enough money doing these voice things. And uh, the the trade-off was instead of getting a pay raise, he got credited as the voice actor for the character. And it's actually the first time a voice actor was credited for a role, which nowadays is insane because if, if you were to fart on a microphone and they didn't give you credit for it, right? <laughs> like, but to do multiple animated short films and not get credit for it, is crazy but that's just the way it was back then voice actors were just somebody who provided sound effects yeah and my understanding was is like when he walked in there you know you know he he was like i want to raise and he was like yeah you know the guy that that he asked for a raise went uh you don't want to raise that's just more taxes uh (laughs) and then the guy was he's like you know then blank is like well what about if we uh you know like what if i get like a little credit line and he's like, well, well, he's like, no one gets a credit line. That would be ridiculous. You know, he's like, but he, he, you know, he's like, well, that's what I want. And so they gave it to him. And what he ended up saying was, from what I read was, is he was much happier having that credit line because now having that credit line almost made him, no, that sounds like a, like he's, you know, borrowing money. Um, but now that he had the line uh, with his name on it. Yeah, the credited um, role. The credited role. Thank you. Um, that allowed him to start getting other opportunities because of right. that because right. because of his talent he now his name's out there so other people are like oh we want him to work for us and yep. and that'll become a big thing closer to like the 50s and 60s uh, when he really starts spreading out and doing work for a lot more companies right um but mm-hmm. porky pig was his first warner brothers voice he did um back to jack benny as well they had a very long relationship um like I said, Jack Benny eventually had a television show where Mel would come on all the time. But a story I read that was kind of how he solidified his place is Jack Benny had this car that they always talked about. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the make of the... the it was an Astro car. something. Uh, I have it in my notes here somewhere. An Astro van? No, no, no. That we're, it's a old car. The only cartoon really vehicle old. I know is the Mystery Mobile. A Maxwell. <laughs> Max yeah, well, I might be cool. actually mixing up a, a different a different car in his story, so continue. But uh, the the Maxwell, which is along the lines of like a Model T style vehicle, um, he so he had a recording of this car, and it was kind of the punchline of the joke was that he had this terrible car. Well, Mel noticed that the phonograph that they used to play the the sound of the car, somebody hadn't plugged it in. So they were almost to the queue where he was supposed to be played, but it wouldn't have played and it would have kind of ruined the the joke and might have even derailed the show. So he just grabs a microphone and starts doing this car impression. And if you hear it, like uh, it is, it's spot on. Sounds like an old dying car that, you know, the hiccuping and coughing. and uh, wow. it, So he just kind of like popped in and did that unexpectedly. And it really solidified his, his place on the Jack Benny show. <laughs> it sounds like he just saved that show. That's what you're saying. Oh, not necessarily like he saved that particular like that episode, show. Yeah, right? that, yeah, exactly. That that broadcast. Yeah, because otherwise it just would have been like, here's dead the joke, air. and then like right. dead air for two or three minutes until somebody figured out to plug in the phonograph. And dead air is like the cardinal sin of radio. Like right, it's because it's, it's, it's it's all live. It's not right. Exactly. <laughs> not pre-recorded. So right. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so, knowing someone that was in the radio business, they talk about sometimes like you have to look down at a timer of like trying to match out the time to when you're going into the next bit where it's so so sometimes if you're listening to radio and it's like and that's why we'll be on here tomorrow at five and the name of the they, commercial. The you human ear that, like, hates or... Yeah, the human ear hates dead air. Like even in my job call taking, they tell you not to have dead air because like people will hang up on you if there's dead air. Like just They'll tune out. Like if they tune to your station and there's dead air, then you're going to another station. <laughs> Why do I get the distinct feeling that you just had an idea for the next time I call you? <laughs> <laughs> just a, a, a lonely click. <laughs> and you're on the air. 
So, um, shortly after uh, the first appearance of Porky Pig in uh, by Mel, at least in February, Mel introduced a new voice, um, a familiar Daffy Duck. I think people might have heard of that one before. Mm. At, and that was in April. So in two months, he started voicing Porky Pig, which is legendary, followed by Daffy Duck. That's amazing. This is the same company, too. Like, they're just, like, starting to make more animated shorts. Yes, yes. This is Warner Brothers and their Looney right. Tunes line, which would then, they would make another one of Merry Melodies, and it, it would go from there. They would just, Silly Symphonies, I think, was also Warner Brothers. So they just kind of had this theme, but... Uh, they were all released as animated short films. So they would, like I said, when you went to see uh, King Kong before it, there would be a little cartoon playing. And that's why a lot of times if you go back and watch like Looney Tunes, they're geared for adults, not children, even though most of us watch them as children because cartoons are for kids. But <laughs> I mean, Elmer Fudd put, putting a gun in somebody's face or they shoot each other and like blow Daffy Duck's bill off and he has to put it back on. Like, yeah, dude. They were drinking and smoking, and like there was Bugs Bunny was in a pimp suit, like a bunch yeah. of times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cross, cross dressing. Um, yeah. I mean, and if you look far enough back, there's a lot of banned Looney Tunes episodes with like racism and things like that in it too. Uh... Because in the 1930s and 40s, that was a way more accepted concept than it is now. You know, we're talking pre civil rights movement. So, um, yeah. I don't Elmer know if Fudd you guys actually. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys got a chance to watch some of those older uh, stuff in your guys' research, but I did see the one with the, uh, you know, um, bugs in the pimp suit. I think it was called Bugs Bunnies, uh, and it was risque. <laughs> Rest my case. I didn't oh. even do any research for this, and I was like, "Bam!" I remember that shit. <laughs> that may and, that, uh, <laughs> that 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 may not have actually been something, but they make it internet. The, the character of Elmer Fudd, when he started, he was actually. A black man that was very, um, we'll say, untastefully characterized. What? Uh, yeah, Elmer Fudd. Look it up sometime. It's the original Elmer Fudd was a very slow talking, uh, heavily accented black man. Well, they use like the southern ac accent kind yeah, of. Right? Yeah, yeah, kind of a kind of a uh, what was the Disney uh, one that uh, Uncle Remus or whatever that was Song of the South. Yeah, that yeah. it was very very reminiscent of that where it was. To watch it now is a little cringe and a little disgusting that it was a thing. But yeah, but in its time, it's like, oh, how delightfully on point, you know. That's uh, that's how they thought. Maybe. And one one also, thing I read also, was that they, they took like an interesting uh, take on it, just like a modern note. Is that Warner Brothers like doesn't like play those? It doesn't like put them in rotation on TV or whatever. But they haven't really like censored it or whatever. Like they, you can still get them on video and stuff. There's just like a disclaimer that says, hey. Like, we made this. We're not going to, like, censor it and claim that it was never made, but, like, things were different back then and blah, blah, blah. So I yeah, thought that was that's, interesting. That's a pretty common practice now because, like, on Disney, with Disney stuff, if you watch on their sure. streaming service, uh, if you turn on, like, say, Aladdin, it'll say that, like, certain things in this were made at the time. They might not be okay now, you know. So they, right. they kind of own up to it. But yeah. Um, also at this time, you had animated shorts were used a lot in, like, war propaganda. I mean, we're late 30s we're getting ready to come into the the world war ii hike Ooh. so they would take characters like bugs bunny and put them in military propaganda films and <laughs> uh disney was just as bad for this like uh i i can remember a disney short where donald duck is saying heil hirohito heil <laughs> you know hitler and all this stuff and yeah i've like, seen that one that's that's like the famous one is yeah uh, the Fuhrer's face or something that's called but yeah so I, a lot of propaganda films at this time too yeah i did see that like bugs bunny was trying to sell bonds like u.s yeah. bonds at one point so and and a lot of them too would have um advertisements in them and the like the war bonds and things they would do that a lot as well um but so daffy duck came in april of 37 and then just a few years later uh there was a short called a wild hare in which bugs bunny debuted and that's probably the most famous i mean they're all pretty parallel famous but bugs bunny is probably the one that everybody knows so three months later um he gave his voice to another character um, woody woodpecker so and the interesting one with this is he didn't voice the character for a long time it was just one film if i remember right but the laugh of woody woodpecker the that was so iconic that they kept 
Mel's cut of the laugh. And even when other people would do the character, they would still use Mel's laugh for Woody Woodpecker. Wow. He's getting his mileage out of that credit then, right? <laughs> and, and, and even there, like, they have to credit him because the precedent's been set. And, you know, everybody's being credited for voice roles now. So even though they use just the laugh, he got credit for that that picture. Literally no work. It was just in a can that they cut. Um, and then in November, so we're still in 1940. November, Tweety Bird makes their debut, his debut, I believe, if I recall. Um, and then by October, uh, let's see, he was working on a dozen network shows. Uh, he was the unhappy Mr. Postman on the Burns and Allen show. Uh, and, and some of these 1930s and 40s names. Botsford yeah. Twink on the Abbott and Costello show. No, I've seen Private it. Sad Sack on the Bob Hope show. And he was a parrot and a police inspector on the Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny. So still with the Jack Benny, he had... Uh, the parrot was probably one of his more famous characters on the Jack Benny thing. Yeah, y'all remember when cigarettes owned television shows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, earlier we had the Jello Jack Benny show, and now we have hoping, Lucky Strike. I was hoping one of you guys would have talked about that. <laughs> I don't want to. I mean, <laughs> on, on the radio, you got to get your advertiser somehow. That's who pays your bills. So right. You know, the Lucky Strike program starting Jack Benny, you know. Well, I'm glad that they don't have such, like, modern pro uh, product placement like that, you know, nowadays. But real quick, I need to go to our advertisers. Uh, thank you guys for <laughs> tuning in for the Verizon halftime show. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so then he just continues to put out these iconic characters. Um, just in the first few months of 1945, we have Pepe Le Pew, Sylvester the Cat, Yosemite Sam. <laughs> I mean, I could just list off the Looney Tunes characters, and that's all Mel's body of work. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, for people... those younger listeners, uh, Pepe Le Pew was a rapist uh, <laughs> a cat or skunk thing. Uh, Speaking of stuff that's not in good taste anymore. <laughs> very problematic. It, 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 it was really in at the time. You know, rape wasn't as bad as badly viewed as it is now. But It was kiss rape, not... Oh, cool I don't think this cool is a line we want to go down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cartoon skunk. Fair enough. Um, some, kind of, some kind of sexual assault, anyway. Right, All right, so right, how, exactly. about, how about this to shake things up? I remember two distinct branches of cartoons being watched when I was a little kid, and it was that recycled programming that you're talking about now. What Did he also do, like, the Tex Avery cartoons? You said he was on all these different networks. Yeah, so um, Tex Avery was a writer. So Tex Avery would write the shorts, and then somebody else would animate them, and then Mel would give the voices. Okay. So any any time that Sylvester, Tweety, Bugs, Daffy, Porky, Yosemite were on, it was Mel. So it didn't matter if it was a Silly Symphony or a Merry Melody or a Looney Tune. If those characters were on, it was his voice. Gotcha. It, that's what I mean. It seems like that's how he must have got. Dude, that credit must have been... No wonder he was happier. No wonder he was happier with that. <laughs> oh, and I mean, just think about, you know, he created the characters, essentially. Like, he didn't draw them, but he had part ownership of those characters. Yeah, whenever you think about Tweety Bird, you have to think about Mel Blanc. You'd like yeah, oh, Putty Tat, you know, that was <laughs> Mel Blanc. Or at every Bugs Bunny toy they sold where you pulled a string and it said, what's up, Doc? He got his 25 cents or whatever. You yeah, know, it, come on. Brilliant. Yeah, so uh, pretty much he played every character uh, in everything, um, yeah, I believe uh, his IMDb. He has over twelve hundred credited roles. I believe that um, in the movie uh, uh, Goodfellas, he actually uh, voiced the three main characters. They just, you know, did that in post. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you say that because he actually has posthumous credits, but we'll we'll talk about that later. Hmm. Um, so, uh, so we're in 1946. Uh, more new characters coming out. Uh, favorite of mine, Foghorn Leghorn. Also, the the dog on there, Barnyard Dog. And then he took over Henry Hawk, which was the little chicken hawk. Man, so he basically, he just took it all. Uh, but still, in that year, um, so he's doing all these voice roles for the animated stuff. And he's also still doing radio. So in, on September 3rd, 1946, he de debuts the Mel Blank Show, which is also called Blank's Fix-It Shop on CBS. 
Uh, and then he signed with Capitol Records in 47. Uh, and his first release was Bugs Bunny Stories for Children featuring Porky Pig and Daffy Duck. It was number two on the Billboard Children's Chart in 1948. So he had a number two album. Granted, it was children's and not Billboard Top 100 or anything, but a, a very successful recording as well. Well, let's not downplay it. I've, I don't have any in the Top 100 for the kids' yeah, Billboards. Benny? Catch up, y'all. If you <laughs> From like 89 to 94, I was on En Fuego on the four <laughs> children's boards. I was singing all kinds of shit in the back of my parents' car. Mostly Looney Tunes stuff that I'd seen. <laughs> like, come to find out you're, you're the one you behind. Don't know. Yeah, tell me you don't know that theme song, that, right? I don't, I'm afraid to replicate it on the internet, but if that, if that little background theme song for the Looney Tunes played, you would know what was about to happen. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. matter how old we get, you're going to remember that. I think that's kind of amazing. Yeah. True. All a right. thousand voices. He thought he was going to get away without having to list all a thousand. Mike, we're only at like, uh, I don't know. I think you've only said like 15. So rapid fire, <laughs> hit me with the other 985. <laughs> um, I have a... <laughs> um, He's going to so, do it. He's going to so do it. On fandom.com for the Looney Tunes fan wikia, uh, I could list off a bunch of characters. Here we go. I'll just give you the highlights here. Uh, so you had Barnyard Dog. You have Bugs Bunny. Cecil Turtle. Oh. Uh, Daffy Duck. Duck. Duck Dodgers, obviously, because it's Daffy Duck. Um, Elmer Fudd. Fernando the Bull. Foghorn Leghorn. Uh, granny. So the Granny, the old woman that was on there that was with Tweety Bird, that was Mel Blanc. <clears throat> So this okay. So <laughs> thank you for doing that because now you're filling out my imagination. He's just like in a studio, just him. There's like some foley work maybe going on around. Like they're recording these things live, right? Like yeah, they're not like multi-tracking and doing layers on like a modern podcast might or a modern song. You just hit a button and it's just record. Like somebody has to smack the celery against the ground while Mel Blank is like doing three voices and they're all like, in yeah, uh, like having a conversation with, with himself. Guitar. It's fantastic. This is fantastic to imagine. Yeah. Um, Speedy Gonzalez, Tasmanian Devil, uh, Wiley Coyote, the Roadrunner. So the little do 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 beep beep. That was him making all the noises. Like, not only could he do different voices and dialects and accents, but he did sound effects. Like, er, again, earlier he was impersonating barnyard animals. Was one of his early jobs. <laughs> so just the different noises and growls and snarls and all that is just Mel Blanc. So just anytime you watch. A Looney Tunes cartoon. Just know that that's basically one person doing all of that. <laughs> that's what that's what's fascinating me. Yeah. So in 1949, he made his motion picture debut, playing Ooh. the character Poncho in the MGM Technicolor musical Neptune's Daughter. So he actually has film credits, <laughs> live action film credits to his his pedigree as well. He began. Uh, he he started on network television. So we're in the the 50s now. Television's becoming a thing. And if I say network television, what's a cartoon that jumps to mind? Uh, geared towards adults in the 50s. Anybody? Spike TV. <laughs> oh, it's a little, a little early. I don't know what the first adult cartoon was. I, I literally I thought. I'm not going to say it's the first, but this was the, probably the biggest one that was. Betty Netflix. Boop? Is that what it is? The Flintstones. The Flintstones. Uh... Yeah, Betty Boop was another one of those like pre movie short things. Okay. But the Flintstones was 1950s. The Flintstones hit network television uh, real wow. big. I mean, and, and that's another funny one that if you go and look on YouTube, you can find like Flintstones and cigarette commercials. I have seen the Flintstones cigarette commercials. Because, somewhere. again, the, the <laughs> Flintstones was kind of a riff on, like, the Honeymooners. Like, they were supposed to be mm -hmm. similar. So it was meant for adults. It was adult programming, primetime animated content. Um, <clears throat> the Jack Benny program, he gets a television show where I was talking about where Mel would come on all the time and do, even if he wasn't on stage, he might be off stage doing voice work, making sound effects and things like that. Uh, then the Bugs Bunny show. Bugs Bunny got his own show on network television where they would replay the animated shorts. Um, and Mr. Magoo, he voiced Mr. Magoo. Back in the 50s. Oh, oh, oh. 
Mel Blanc, 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 you've, Mel Blanc, Blanc, you've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, uh, you cannot you cannot turn over a leaf without this guy. Yeah, turning so up. Easy. yeah so he, he continues to just spout out piece after piece. Um, he does Cosmo Spacely on the Jetson. So, Jetson, you're fired. <laughs> that was... That was Mel Blank. Uh, oh, wow. He did. He also he did Barney Rubble on the Flintstones. That was the voice he did. Uh, but he also did Dino the Dinosaur. Um, <laughs> and then as Hanna Barbera starts picking up steam here in the fifties and sixties, he gets uh, Secret Squirrel, Speed Buggy, Captain Caveman, Wally Gator, all sorts of stuff. Like he's just or not Wally Gator himself, but voices on the Wally Gator show and on Penelope Pitstop. He would do little like. Uh, insert random character he did a lot of bit work instead of just doing the main characters as well yeah, um fascinating. he uh started doing vocal effects for tom and jerry in the 60s um and he was also the first voice of toucan sam for fruit <laughs> wow. but uh yeah so all over the place but um uh, we have some tragedy here oh, january no. 24th 1961 uh, Mel Blank was involved in a near-fatal car accident. Um, he was driving alone when he collided head-on with a car driven by an 18-year-old college student uh, on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, the kid received minor injuries, but Blank was rushed to the hospital with a triple skull fracture, um, two broken legs, and a broken uh, pelvis. Oh, uh, Jesus. And he was in a coma. Oh, jeez. Yeah, well, you have to also keep in mind, I mean, this this place that he was driving is was really well known for being, like, totally safe. I think it was called a Dead Man's Curve. Yeah, Dead Man's Curve. <laughs> Literally the song, Dead Man's Curve, was written about this spot on Sunset Boulevard. Um, and eventually, um, because he would come out of the coma, we'll talk about that in just a second, but eventually he, like, filed a lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles along with other people that eventually got that intersection redone. So he's kind of a, a name behind to get it done. Got done a little bit quicker when you have somebody famous suing you for five hundred thousand dollars. Who cares if a bunch of random assholes die in car crashes? <laughs> but Mel Blanc almost died for Christ's sake. Yeah, dude, You're gonna kill we gotta fix Buck. that. <laughs> when, when, with you. Yeah, and you know, when you've got, you know, basically twelve hundred different people, you know, that, <laughs> that So uh, due to this car accident, he was in a coma. Um, and the doctors were having trouble, didn't think he'd ever come out of it until one day one of the neuro neurologists came in and he had kind of an idea. So he went up to Blank, who's laying unconscious in a coma, and he said, uh, how are you feeling today, Bugs? And Mel Blank, in a coma, replies, eh, just fine, Doc. Dude, and you Bugs have got to voice. shut the front door. <laughs> so, so then the doctor went, uh, well, is Tweety in there with you too? And he got... I taught a putty tat. You know, he started talking in the voices in his coma, and he actually came out in an interview later and said the character saved his life because he didn't come out of the coma. Bugs Bunny did, Daffy Duck, Tweety Bird. That's that's what brought him out of the coma. Yeah. And, but, I mean, when that's all you do for 30 years, eventually they're going to become more of you than you are, right? Like, they're, they're him. They're a part of him. I don't know how I feel about that. Well, if you guys remember <laughs> on that uh, on that previous episode of uh, of uh, UAS when we talked about um, uh, Franz Ferdinand, it was everything leading up to that moment was like if if someone had written it, it would be really really bad writing. Yeah. Uh, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. the inverse of that. <laughs> that gave yeah. me goosebumps. I mean, the only way it would have been better is if it wasn't a car crash and an anvil fell on his head. <laughs> uh, tragic anvil factory accident that is where you have to cut the woody woodpecker laugh in right there <laughs> <laughs> hey well what better cure for tragedy than comedy so he didn't die right he he, he, he did not die there. no he, he he uh well i mean he was interestingly enough um when you're doing a lot of voice acting work you can't be bedridden with a torso cast for your broken legs and pelvis and so he was actually doing work from his hospital bed. Uh, they Warner Brothers would send people in to record his voice while he's laying in a hospital bed. <laughs> and uh, But the work schedule was pretty hectic. So his son, Noel, 
um, who sounds exactly like him. Like if mm-hmm. you, his son can do a lot of the voices and everything. Um, he did a lot of, of ghost acting, I guess, where he would do Mel's parts, but it was his son. Um, and then they had other people come in and kind of pick up characters. So like if you're watching some Looney Tunes and Bugs Bunny sounds a little weird, might have been during, made during the early 60s when he was out of commission and they had Dawes Butler or Stan Freeberg or one of the other big voice actors of that time come in and do his parts. Hmm. Uh, That's crazy. Pretty big shoe to fill, probably. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, the guy has, you know, just on that, that website listing off Looney Tunes characters, just Looney Tunes characters, there's over 100 that he did. So if they're doing a, a Looney Tunes movie and they have seven characters and the voice actors, Mel Blank, Mel Blank, Mel Blank, you know, <laughs> kind of tough to record all that from a hospital bed when you're trying to rest. That's a lot of, <laughs> lot of eggs in one basket. That's, yeah, that's... <laughs> The yeah. cause of the coma was the triple skull fracture. So he's trying to do all this with a broken skull, basically. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see uh, the credits for that when it's, you know, it'd be like a, a, a college student's, you know, film uh, credits where it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, who, who did the lighting? Tim, uh, directed by Tim, <laughs> written by Tim, you know. <laughs> It's like this the move the film itself was 13 minutes why is there eight and a half minutes of your name on credits so so um as we get into the 70s um he kind of slows down they the looney tunes and things those animated short films aren't as prominent as they were earlier um so he's kind of in a weird place where work-wise but he's the voice of all these crazy characters he can figure something to do um, so he started doing a lot of uh, commercials and college lectures. So he would go around the United States and give college lectures about voice acting and working in radio and different things like that. But he started doing commercials for American Express. That was the first big one where he would be Bugs Bunny on American Express commercials. Um, and then he would do different specials for like the Shriners and different things like that. He would just, he was kind of like uh, wherever he needed to be, he was a big enough name that he could draw a crowd. So he could, he was very useful in that. Um, and then they, Warner Brothers started using the Looney Tunes characters for like uh, sequence buffers and stuff. So when they would be promoting something, it would be Bugs Bunny coming on, like, go out and see this picture, Doc or whatever, you know. And it was Mel doing a lot of that stuff here and there. And then they started releasing some other movies, like uh, they did a lot of like compilations or even brand new animation. Um, so like they did the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie and the Looney, Looney, Looney Bugs Bunny movie and like stuff like that that came out. So he was oh, doing all that. These titles. <laughs> uh, and the last Looney Tunes role was in Bugs Bunny's Wild World of Sports, which came out in 89. That was the last Looney Tunes recording he did. Oh. He wasn't there for Space Jam. I was, dude, I was so fucking <laughs> hopeful you were going to say he was in Space Jam. No, yeah. I can tell you who did Bugs Bunny in Space Jam, and it's a name you all know. Kevin. Michael Jordan. My, my... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the voice of Bugs Bunny in Space Jam is Billy West. Um, a lot of Oh, no kidding. Uh, yeah. Fry no. from Futurama. Yeah. yeah. He actually, side note, um, I during my research, it came up a lot of like people talking about Mel Blanc and uh, Billy West had a bit where he was talking about how a radio show had like a sound like Mel Blanc contest and Billy West called in and then got like cold feet and hung up the phone <laughs> and then he got mad at himself. So he kept calling back and it was busy. So he's getting madder and madder and they finally answered and he starts like swearing at the guys like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. And they're like, hold on, you're going on the air. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that That's was a, Billy West when he was a kid, that was one of the things that happened. But um, some more uh, live action roles. He uh, in the movie, I guess not live action, but the the movie's live action. His role wasn't uh, Strange Brew. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that movie. Mm. Uh, the Rick Moranis and uh, was that John Candy, eighties kind of cult film. Uh, he did a voice of the main character's father, who was like off camera, so he would just like they would just voice it. Um, and the uh, last big movie he did was Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah, so yeah, that, that was that one. pretty pretty obvious. It has all those characters in it, which that movie is, I think, the only time that Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse appear at the same time. But it was funny because Disney and Warner Brothers were going back and forth on that one. 
they had to have the exact same amount of screen time and <laughs> one couldn't get up on the other one. Like they bugs couldn't like hit Mickey Mouse with a mallet or something. They had to have <laughs> identical screen time and neither one of them could be portrayed as better than the other. <laughs> That's Ooh. funny. It's it's just crazy that like these cartoon characters have contracts in movies. Right. That sounds like a logistical nightmare. Um, the the uh, caveat to that was the Yosemite Sam in Who Framed Roger Rabbit was somebody else because Blank's, uh, his smoking habit was starting to wreak havoc on his voice. And we all know Yosemite Sam's, oh, I hate that rabbit, with a real <laughs> deep, gravelly voice. So when you've been smoking since the age of nine. Um, oh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Know. He started, you, he started you, smoking at nine years old. You, you kind of buried the lead there, Mike. That would have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I can imagine why he had a teacher that said he wasn't going to amount to a whole lot as he's smoking cigarettes just like that yeah. baby. Hey, he, uh, from nine years old, he had a pack a day habit until he was diagnosed with emphysema, which pushed him to quit at age 77. Oh, I Shocking. thought you were going to say 13 when the doctor was like that. <laughs> no, 77. So he smoked for almost 70 years. Get out. Mel, what are you doing? What are you doing in your room, Mel? I'm just doing my homework. <laughs> you know, like, that is just insane. Yeah. But I mean, but back um, then, I mean, they would probably prescribe cigarettes to like, you know, cure tumors or whatever. So I think they were doing just that pretty the close. The doctor was smoking as he's like, oh, I'm wrong with their lungs, kid. I don't know what it is. <laughs> All right, kid's not tough enough. Just give him a cigarette. Um, and then his last film he ever recorded was for Jetsons the Movie. Um, that was the last recording he did on film, and that came out in 1990. Um, but also, he and his son back in the 60s um, started their own uh, business called Blank Communications Corporation, which was a media company that's still in operation. Um, they do a lot of like public service announcements and commercials. So whenever you see like, uh, you know, somebody famous up there talking about something, say it's uh, on here, they list uh, Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas is talking to you about the dangers of drinking and driving. If you watch at the end, it's probably produced by Blank Communications Corporation. Huh. So yeah, that, that's another way he continued to make money. Got in the game, guys. I'm officially going to change my last name to Redacted. <laughs> yes, I'm still, I'm still on that. I'm still on that. So, <laughs> so damn. um, on May nineteenth, nineteen eighty nine, uh, he was checked in to the Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Uh, oh, no. He had a really bad cough uh, while he was shooting a commercial, and his family urged him to to go to the hospital. Um, he was originally expected to recover, and then it took a sudden turn for the worse when they found out he had advanced coronary artery disease. And uh, he was in the hospital for about two months before he died in July, July tenth, nineteen eighty nine. Now, uh, now coronary artery disease, uh, or as his son uh, puts it. Fell out of bed. Yeah. Uh, Which I think is the technical term. There is a uh, a little dispute there between his son and every doctor's report. So. Yeah, because I, when I, like the documentary I watched, his son's on there is like, yeah, so we're shooting this commercial. And I didn't realize he was like, he actually meant we. Like they were, he they're selling uh, a, a, some car. Um, and I remember, like, you could see them, like, talking in the car, and he's he's got, like, all, like, even though Mel's in the back seat, he's voicing, like, seven different Looney Tunes characters. <laughs> like, this is, like, you know, uh, you know, Nutty Professor style. Um, oh, my gosh. And, and you know, like, all, all of that's going on. So then when, because he has to do all that, he's recording for hours. So goes to the hospital. Uh, and then his son, like, he's like, yeah, you went to the hospital and they were like, yeah, you can go home if you want to. It's no big deal. And he was like, well, I think I'll stay an extra night. And he goes, and him staying that extra night is what caused him to die. Cause then two days later he fell out of bed and, uh, it caused enough problems that that's what caused his death. So for whatever reason, um, you know, uh, what he, he died at 81, 81. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, 72 years uh ago was when he started smoking uh, you know according to that day that <laughs> he quit at 77 he quit when okay he was oh well then that changes everything <laughs> uh what's that 
Give the man some credit, Scott. Right, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, told... Everyone knows as soon as you stop smoking, your lungs just go back to normal. Right. And I... Amazing nine-year-old kids. Yeah. <laughs> that, my son is nine. Like, he's dude, I should go check on him right now. On a pack-a-day yeah, habit. If he's watching Looney Tunes, look out. What do you want for dinner? Yeah, look how successful he was. <laughs> yeah, Why the it's child. Ooh, yeah. Matt. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> go in there. Well, what do you want for dinner? Marlboros. <laughs> <laughs> So, Get a microphone. So, so yeah, uh, so clearly there, there's some some difference of opinion there, but I mean, I, I don't entirely understand why. Um, but but yeah, coronary artery disease. I don't imagine that just pops up from falling out of bed. Right. Not not usually. Um. So uh, the last little punch from Mel is that his headstone reads, "That's all, folks." Aww. Oh, of course it does. <laughs> Which was one of his key catchphrases as Porky Pig. But this dude had some really interesting little tidbits about him, too, that I would like to, to pick and poke at that I couldn't figure out where to fit in chronologically. But um, he, uh, shortly before his death, um, Warner Brothers, or executives from Time Warner, which owned Warner Brothers, asked him if there was anything, literally anything they could give him to thank him for his life's body of work, and he asked for an Edsel. A what? A Ford Edsel, the car. Okay. <laughs> Is it, wasn't the Edsel, like, a terrible car? Uh, well, I would I would venture to say the fact that this is the first time I've heard of it would, would, <laughs> would put it into the realm of forgettable cars. Well, I mean, I'm just basing it off of Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, and in it there's a line that was, Edsel is a no-go. So I'm assuming that it maybe it was rare. Maybe that's why he wanted it. Dude, I tell you what, in our 45 to 65 demographic, you are killing it. I, I'm all about it. <laughs> yeah, someone's listening right, to this. Here you go. Here you go. Like... Let's say they released it in uh, 1958. Ford invested in an advertising campaign marketing Edsel, marketing Edsel's as the cars of the future. It introduced multiple advanced features for its price segment, and the launch of the model would become symbolic of commercial failure. <laughs> introduced in a recession that catastrophically affected sales of medium priced cars, Edsels were considered overhyped, unattractive, and low quality. So oh, I feel like, I'm I feel a like car. That's, another, that's another joke, right? Because they're like, What can we give you anything for your life's body of work? He's like, That failure of a car. That's what I want. Um, wow. Also during uh, World War II, he provided the voice of Private Snafu in training films for soldiers. Um, and interestingly enough, these training films were written by Theodore Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss. Ah, okay. So, World War II training films for soldiers, voiced by Mel Blanc, written by Dr. Seuss. Yeah, well, we're canceled. Dude, I gotta tell you, I, I wasn't a big fan of Mel changing his name, but Dr. Seuss going from Theodore, whatever the hell yeah, the last of that was... Uh, yeah, to this, uh, I thumbs up, two thumbs up. I always find it so wholesome because, like, you go back to that time period and, like, everybody was, like, all in on the Nazi, on fighting Nazis, you know? <laughs> like, there wasn't, like, this divide like we have now. We're like, well, I don't know if Nazis are so bad. Everybody was like, yeah, Nazis. Like, Bug Bunny hates Nazis. Fucking <laughs> Mickey Mouse hates, hates Nazis. Nazis. <laughs> yeah, they all hate Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do, 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 do down with passage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, They're so, despicable. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody do a bad voice impression. <laughs> nostalgic drift. Um, when when asked in interviews, um, Sylvester the cat is the closest to his actual voice. He just threw the lisp on at the end. So if you hear Sylvester uh -huh. talk. That's what Mel Blanc sounded like, minus the lisp. Um, his favorite character to do was Daffy Duck, but his least favorite was Yosemite Sam because it was terrible on your voice. And I've also I saw other videos of other voice actors saying it was such a hard role for Warner Brothers to fill because people would do it once or twice and then couldn't do it again because they would wreck their voice trying to do it. So he also had a collection of over 300 antique watches. Oh. Um including ones dating back to 1510 was the earliest watch he had. Dang. Interesting thing to collect. Um, also, back to the, his relationship with Jack Benny and their, their close friendship, uh, Jack Benny once said that there are only five real people in Hollywood. Everybody else is Mel Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, man. When you listed all those different voices, 
Yeah, and, and it's just the like I said, his IMDb has over twelve hundred credits. Um, I was I was browsing through those and some of the later ones that kind of caught my eye that aren't Looney Tunes related. Um, he actually had a voice credit in uh, twenty thirteen for Tom and Jerry's voice, so they must have used <laughs> like canned footage. Um, also in 2020, but that was, uh, like a volume of Bugs Bunny movies, so that doesn't count. Um, but yeah, he just did, like, bit roles on everything. Uh, he, Flintstones, kids, he was Captain Caveman, I mean, and Dino as well. I mean, this is just 80s nostalgia for anybody. Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats. Heathcliff. (laughs) Uh, he did a bunch of uncredited additional voices on Alvin and the Chipmunks. Oof. Um. yeah, just Yogi Bear's All Star Comedy Christmas Caper. He did Barney Rubble was in there. Plus, he did some other voices. It's like everything he's in, he did this, 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 and this. It's very rarely just one thing. Oh, and it's just he's so prolific. I mean, he's known as the man of a thousand voices, and it's they ain't lying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's Mel Blank in a roughly one hour nutshell. Yeah, and I I want to make uh, just a quick comment sure. on the on the on the whole. I I you know I may be making some like jokes at some very ill timed things uh, on this episode, but it cannot be underexpressed. Uh, you know my respect for what Mel was able to do to an entire industry, uh, and what he was two, able two to industries really because he started in radio <clears throat> and then moved on to to film. So right. You know, and he, the the man had an amazing work ethic and, you know, uh, brought an intensity to uh, characters, you know, voice characterization, as they say uh, in the credits, uh, that, you know, it's probably still unmatched at that level. So. Oh, one more thing. I just I just remembered this one. Um, he was very open to his fans, like, you know, how a lot of Hollywood types will just uh, don't have time for a picture or an autograph or whatever. But he was so open to it that he kept postcards on his front doorstep that had all the Looney Tunes characters on them. And people would just come up and knock on his door and ask for an autograph. And he would answer in, like, his bathrobe or whatever and sign the <laughs> autograph and hand it off. So, like, like he would always have neighborhood kids and stuff bringing people over to his house to get autographs. And he, he loved it to the point where he just put the postcards on his porch instead of, oh, you got something for me to sign? He just always had it. I just realized what Matt's nightmare looks like. Yeah, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I would rather die than constantly and, and you have to answer in a different policy. <laughs> right. Yeah, and the whole time that you're signing it, they're like, make Bugs Bunny say poop on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> poop on a stick, doc. <laughs> yeah, but to Scott's point, I, I think it's interesting that he was like a professional voice actor that did like all the voices and it's interesting because these days you have like celebrities get a lot of voice acting work and stuff. And I think the quality is not as good sometimes. You know, well, you yeah, just get like I'm... a big name to do a voice acting job. Yeah, my, my, uh, the one I always go to when people bring up this topic is Chris Rock and Madagascar. Like, it's yeah. just a zebra that sounds like Chris Rock. Like, he's yeah, not even exactly. acting. It's just being right. And a lot of the celebrity yeah. voice actors, like you're talking about, they always say that voice acting is such an easy job and a cushy job. Well, of course it right. is when you have a giant name to go along with it. You don't have to do anything. Well, and you're but, not, like you said, you're not doing a voice. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, the rock Whereas, in, like, in Moana is just, he's just, it's just him. Like, he didn't do a voice for, for Maui. He's just doing right. his, yeah, his own yeah. voice. Whereas, you know, like I mentioned Billy West earlier, you know, that's yeah. somebody that, if you watch a show a lot, you'll recognize the name. You know, uh-huh. I know that we're all fans of, well, almost all of us, Scott, withstanding, are fans of Futurama. Yeah. Scott just haven't, hasn't given it a chance. So I could list off names like uh, Billy West. I could list off John DiMaggio. Yep. Uh, you know, and those, those are names that come up over and over in those credits. Well, if it weren't for Mel Blanc, you'd have no idea who did those voices. Mm-hmm. Because he he was the one that pushed for voice actors to get credit for what they were doing. Um, to the point of he was ready to quit a very, very lucrative job, obviously, now that we know what Looney Tunes has become, but he was ready to quit over probably at the time a few dollars wages, you know, in the right. 30s and 40s, uh, and they they made that compromise. So it's just, and even now, 
to this day in 2021, a lot of people don't know voice actors like they know celebrities because it's a lot easier to put a face to a name mm-hmm. than it is to put a voice to a name. I have no idea what Mel, Mel Blanc's face looks like right now. No idea. Um, uh, so it's it a little wrinkly. Um, <laughs> I'll describe it in pure, pure detail. Two eyes. Uh, he's got like this triangle thing on the front of his face below that and then kind of a semicircle below. Uh, hair, a little bit of ears. Um, you get in the picture? I a picture if you'd like me to. I just keep seeing Daffy Duck. <laughs> that is that, I mean, that is exactly it what it is, yeah. But um, <laughs> this is classic Mel Blanc that I will share to the Discord. Anyway, um, but yeah, just the the opportunity he gave other people, you know, and it, it bothers me. I, I'm <laughs> this was my topic to pick, and obviously, I'm I'm a huge fan of voice acting. I've kind of followed it as a hobby, and just to see what people do different characters. <laughs> you okay there? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm cracking up looking at the picture. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, he looks like my buddy's uncle or something. He's a sweet <laughs> Jewish boy from, from San Francisco. It's so unassuming. Yeah, you would never expect that is the man behind thousands no. of voices. I expect that man to try and sell me a vacuum at my doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's going to sell you advertising on the radio. <laughs> well, the problem is back then everybody looked the same. Remember we were talking about in the George Carlin episode, how controversial <laughs> it was that he stopped wearing a suit? That's like, true. Back then, fucking everybody wore a suit and had hair like that. Like, back hair, mustache. <laughs> and it could be anybody. He could be a crooner, a Hollywood crooner. Yeah, I mean, they all look like that. <laughs> so, so yeah, just the fact that he was so instrumental in that that process for voice actors to get credit, and I don't know. I feel like voice actors. I'm not saying actors don't don't have a craft that they're a master of because you have that the body work and the the emotions and things like that that go into it. But imagine doing that when nobody can see you and still being able to convey that emotion or, or what's going on. That, that is in and of itself, not to mention you're doing it as crazy goofy voices that aren't yours. So you don't have as, you don't have as many tools, right? Like the actor has their whole body to use as a tool, you know, you have your, your facial expression and and your posture, but but he's doing it just with his voice. Right. And Mel Blanc um, was such a method actor when it came to that people would say that they could tell what character he was voicing without hearing him because he would always do like whenever he did bugs, he would have a certain posture and motions he would do, or when he did Daffy, he would, you know, so a lot of them do it. You just don't see it. So they're basically doing full on acting, but you just get the voice instead of the. So it's voice acting is something that is, I don't think it's enough credit for what it is. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you. I, and I've seen like uh, over the years, like I noticed I was watching 101 Dalmatians with my kids Aww. and they, they, at the beginning, at the credits of that movie, it lists the voice actors, but it doesn't credit their roles. Right. I thought it was interesting. Whereas like nowadays when, you know, it's like a normal movie, it'll say like this role, this person. But back then it was just like featuring the voice talents of right. like, six and, people or whatever. But I think part of that too was kind of the mystique so that, you you knew that person was doing like that person got credit, but they couldn't mm-hmm. say that this is my character or you know it it, yeah, it, yeah. it, it was it let Disney take advantage of people or it let Warner <laughs> Brothers take advantage right. of people, and that was just the practice in the the forties fifties you know. Mm-hmm. I also feel like it would have taken a long time to list credits for all one hundred and one dominations. <laughs> I don't believe they all have speaking rules. <laughs> There, there are like 15 important ones in that movie. Maybe yeah. I remember this movie differently. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, actually, but yeah. when, I, when I watched it with my kids for the first time, I didn't remember. Like, I thought that the, the mom and the dad had, had 99 babies. No, that's 15. not actually. Yeah, that's not actually. <laughs> they had a lot of babies, but not 99. <laughs> yeah, there are 15 Dalmatians. And then if I remember right, they like when the they rescue him from Corilla de Villa or whatever there's right. like all the puppies she had like rounded up to make her right. own jacket or whatever yeah exactly she, yeah. she wanted one outfit and needed a hundred puppies yeah yeah make that cartoon now 
<laughs> yeah, that, you want to talk about like adult subject matter in a children's cartoon? That one is really it's messed like, up. Like Mel one, Blank did some shit. Yeah, sorry. At one point, they, the heat is like coming down on him, and Cruella comes in. She's like, "Yeah, just gas him or shoot him or hit him over the head. I don't care." <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, that concludes our episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. That concludes our episode on Mel Blank. Uh, this week, uh, once again, uh, thank you, uh, Mike, for being in the hot seat and doing all the research. Uh, you can follow Mike at, at Dungeon Master, uh, followed by me, uh, which is uh, Scott. Uh, you can follow me at That One Loud Guy. You can follow Matt at Matural20. And you can follow Vinny at William Shatner. Uh, we'll be taking a week hiatus uh, for the next episode, and we'll be coming back the week after that. So I look forward to seeing you guys. And uh, that's the end of the episode.